On this channel, I've been able to review a couple of KVM over IP devices, or IKVM as some people call them the, for short. And they're pretty interesting devices because you can just connect it to your network and then you plug it into whatever machine you want to control. And you can see whatever's on the screen over the network through a web browser as though you're connected directly to that machine. So you can control it anywhere on your network at home or even remotely if you enable that sort of access via VPNs or whatever cloud service uh, if they offer that option. The only potential downside is it requires a network in order to operate. And most of the time you're going to have a network anyway and, and it's going to work really well. But what if you're traveling with a, a device like a laptop and you have another device you want to control or you have something beside your desk here and you don't want to have to plug everything into the network even though it's just sitting right next to your machine. So there's another type of KVM device that's called a KVM over USB and that does all the same kinds of things as KVM over IP except you connect it with you directly to the device using a USB cable. So that's very interesting because you don't even need any network to be able to control the, the device that you're connected to. And that's very convenient when you're when you have a machine next to the machine you're trying to control like I do a lot with like many PCs for demonstrations like now that I have this table back here this this could be a perfect use case for a USB KVM so TechX Artisan sent me a KVM over USB device called Open Interface it's supposed to be like open interface mash together the words right open interface it's kind of hard to say a little bit one thing i noticed when i opened the box is it comes with a really nice uh case it's got this like kind of clamshell type case here and you open it up and it has all the stuff inside so you get a nice orange flexible usb cable it has usb c on one side and the other side has a standard usb a port but you can unhook it and make it a usb c port and so this goes between the USB KVM and your host. And then you get another USB cable that has USB-C on one side and USB-C on the other. And it also has USB-A. So if you need that adapter, you have it on this cable as well. That goes between the target machine and the USB KVM. Then we get a HDMI cable. So you can see the screen. It's just a short little cable because it's supposed to be right next to the box you're controlling. So it doesn't need to be long. And let's see, we also got a VGA to HDMI adapter and it has a separate audio jack that you can plug into this USB KVM so you can still get the audio uh, from the system over uh, through the uh, HDMI port here. So that's uh, pretty nice if you have a, a legacy system or some servers only have VGA support. So this would be nice if you want to try to control a, an older system or like a server or something that only has VGA output. You get a little quick start guide, tiny little guide here. You get some stickers and there's a thank you card here. Well, thank you for your support. So here is the open interface is, as you can see on the label there, hopefully it, it'll focus and you'll see we got the ports here that connects to the host machine. And there's a little switch here that's interesting because you can connect a USB like thumb drive here and you can switch between the target machine and the host on which machine you want to have that USB port connected to. And so it's, that's pretty handy because you could copy some files from the, ho uh, the host machine on a USB drive and then switch it to the target machine and you could copy files over back and forth between the USB port without even unplugging the USB thumb drive. So you could just use that as a way to transfer files back and forth because you don't have a network connection. So this is where you hook your HDMI port on the back side, and then you have the target machine's USB port. And that's where you use that short USB cable and the short HDMI cable, you connect it to the target machine. And so it's just a very simple, tiny little box. You can see how small it is in my hand. It comes with this little plastic piece here, which is interesting. And I, I was looking at what that is and, and the documentation says you could take off this plastic piece and put this one on. And basically it exposes an extra interface that you can use if you want for development mode is what they call it. So you can connect to it and do some development work on this on this uh, open interface device, it's designed to be open. That's part of the name, like open source. So you can uh, get access to the inside internals of this device by exposing that port on there. It says if you take that off and put this on, 
you kind of avoid the warranty because you're, 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 you're going into a more advanced development mode. So that's something to consider. But if you're going to be doing that, you probably like to tinker and you know what you're doing and you don't care if you mess this up. So this is another one of those crowdsourced products. So instead of Kickstarter, it's crowd supply and they're pretty close to shipping this product. Cause I said in the US, it might arrive a little bit before Christmas, but it's not guaranteed. So they said in other parts of the world, mid January. So possibly early January, late December, early January for US customers. If you order this soon, depending on what their availability is. So the cost of this product, if you buy just the open interface, I don't think it comes with any cables and it's $89 and it's $8 shipping for US customers. So if you get the whole toolkit, which has this nice case and all of the cables, it's $109 plus eight shipping for all of what you've seen, except for this cable, this cable, they show it as being $19 if you really need it. They sent me all of the items. So this, this total cost of this would be, you know, $130, $140, something like that. So I want to demonstrate how this device works and how you plug it in. Just plug the orange USB cable into your computer and then connect the USB to the host side of the open interface. And next you'll connect the HDMI input to the target side of the open interface, as well as the USB cable. Then you plug the HDMI cable into the target machine, as well as the USB cable. I want to show how you compile the software on the Linux operating system. So if you go to the openinterface.com website and go, you know, go to their apps page, You'll, you'll be able to find that there is a Linux version here. If you click on this, it'll take it to the GitHub page. And some of these instructions aren't perfect here, but you, they don't have pre-compiled deep files like it says here. I think that's their intention at some point. So we just need to skip down to build from source and run because that's all the options we got. And so you would just copy and paste these commands to get the environment that you need. I already have all these, so it's going to say I have them. So it's going to be a little bit slow here, of course, when I do this demo. It, just, it, is, it was fast earlier, but anyway, I already have all these things uh, installed. And then you can do a git clone and pull the latest from the repository, or you can come up here and just download the files for the latest version if you don't want the latest and greatest daily snapshots, basically. Uh, so this one, if you look over to the... Uh, releases here. Yeah, this is version 0 .0, 0.0.5 is the latest at the time of this video. And you can scroll down here and just click on download zip or targz. Then right click it and ex extract it. Most Linux operating systems let you just extract it right away. So that's pretty straightforward. It's very similar to Windows, how to extract it. I'm not going to show you those details. And then it says you have to uh, do th these couple commands here to get it to compile. So that's all we need to do is once we Extract it. I already have it on a folder here on this right hand side. So we're going to go to CD and then I have the uh, open interface folder already. And I have, I think, yeah, point dash zero zero five. So we're going to go into that folder. Uh, notice my, since I downloaded the specific release, it's not going to have this folder name. If you did it from Git, it's going to have this folder name here. So just keep that in mind. But I'm just going to show you how to compile this specific version. And then just go mkdir build to create a new folder in there. And then we're going to go into that folder. And then we're going to do qmake6, like it says up here, and then do dot dot. And then it created this little creating stash file, it says. And then we just do make and then do dash j. Actually, why don't I just copy and paste, right? <laughs> make my life a little bit easier. Um, so make sure we don't miss anything. All right, now that it's compiled, <clears throat> we can just run the application. If I do this and do open interface, it creates this executable and it brings up the window. Okay. Notice it's down here it says permission denied. It still works, even though it says permission denied. You have to increase it. I notice that there's some glitches here. If you notice on this window here, if I don't resize it properly, it, there are some glitches. But if I stretch it out far enough and not make it too wide or tall. I can keep that status bar at the bottom and go up here to the top and stretch it up here. And I have to fix it down here. Watch if I just bump it over a little bit farther. 
Uh, there's some some options here like zooming in so zooming in actually works zooming out works okay and this is i think a full screen mode or something it doesn't work and let's see what's this one and this one here toggles keyboard keys at the top some some function keys if you want to send it to the target machine and i think this one's paste so let's see up here at the top there's another place you can do paste yep you can also do it from up here as well. That was the last command that we just did. Uh, you know, when we compiled the application, so that's why that one's there. I'm not sure what this does, but look, look at my mouse. It's like, what's it doing? You know, uh, it's a screensaver. That's what it says, deactivated. So uh, there's some kind of screensaver option there. I'm not sure what the deal is with that. And then that's a some kind of looks like supposed to be like a contrast mode or something. I think it must be how you can set the contrast. So that's not available yet either. So there's some things that need to be polished in this. So I plug my USB drive into my open interface and I have it set to host and you can see it's popping up here is my uh, thumb drive here on my host machine. And then you'll see I'm on, this is my target machine. So I'm gonna flip the switch. I'm doing the physical switch. And you'll see at the top it says target and it should show up here soon. I think it takes a second Yep, to show up. See, there it is. So now I can, transfer files back and forth between the two systems uh, pretty seamlessly. So now it's just uh, loading this here, which is my thumb drive that I'm using here is a little bit slower, but it works, I can get to the files. So that's a pretty cool functionality to be able to go to transfer files back and forth with a USB drive without unplugging it. I can just switch it back and forth between the two different systems. Let's see if the button works. So let's go back. I, I closed out the thing. Let's see, if, let's see if the software button works. So if I do that, it unmounted it there. And we'll see if it mounts it. Yep. So it unmounted it back onto my host machine. So that software button works and the hardware button works. So that's that's cool. So that's some basic functionality that does work, which is great. So there's a community effort to make a web version of the open interface called the Open Interface Viewer. And you can see it on open interface viewer.pages.dev. And I'll put a link below for this. But you see there's a nice little web interface that mimics the desktop client. You can even do dark mode for people that like dark mode, so I'll just switch to that so it's easier on your eyes. To get started, you just need to click on this toggle monitor capture, and then it's going to ask you if you want permissions while visiting this site. And you can say allow while visiting the site, and now you can see the video image on here. And you might, you may or may not need to toggle these tech capture buttons here if your mouse and keyboard's not working like mine is. And I noticed if you, you have to click it a second time sometimes to get this box to pop up, but it'll say USB serial, and you want to be able to connect that device and you might have to toggle this back again sometimes the mouse doesn't work after you do it the first time and then you have to wait some time or reset it or unplug it and eventually it'll work again so i'm not sure what's up with that even though the mouse is not working here i i'll cut to a clip where i did get it working and so that's a little bit frustrating if you're trying to do this on linux so as you can see, after enabling the permissions, then I can get in here and open, say, Notepad and just start typing away like that. And the responsiveness of it is pretty good. It, so this might be a good alternative if you're having trouble with the native apps and you just want to control it through the web browser. This one is hosted on Cloudflare Pages, so you would need network access to be able to, to locally control the machine you're connected to, unlike the native desktop software. But you could download the software and run it in a local web server and you can still have full local access and travel with it no matter where you go so this could be a good alternative to the native apps so i'm glad to see the community effort around producing alternative interfaces as i demonstrated in this video the linux desktop experience is still rough around the edges and i imagine it is with windows potentially as well because i think they originally designed the software to be on, work well on mac os because andrew pilardi's uh, youtube channel he reviewed this in like june of 2024 and i'm now looking at this you know now it's january 2025 and i'm still having issues that he didn't seem to have when he was using it on his mac and it seemed like a better experience you know it had a little bit less features that were released at that time back in june and so i just think it's a, more of a linux polish issue and so I, the ma biggest issue i had was the mouse and keyboard wouldn't always work and sometimes it seemed like that process would get hung like when it's trying to use the serial console to access the mouse and keyboard on the on the on the target machine, it was just it was just not working for some reason. And because I could see the debug logs was keep was just like trying to reconnect and reconnect and or restarting that serial console. So there's something kind of wonky there, and I'm not quite sure what it is that really hinders the experience of using this device 
on Linux, you might have a way better experience on a Mac OS. Could be night and day. And for this type of product, that for a to rely on a desktop-based software, if that software is not fully polished, that's going to really hinder the experience of this device. But once I once it gets a little more polished, it's going to be great. You know, I, I think because it's a really nice use case for this type of KVM. Uh, that's where like the I like the KVM over IP devices because you just use a web browser and you can do it on any machine that has a web browser and it, that works pretty well. And that's why I'm hoping that web version of the community driven project would work well. But it was just that mouse and keyboard issue that I was having. And it's probably just a Linux thing. But I wanted to try it on Linux because that's make primarily what I use. So I'm going to like keep an eye on the software, the, the progress of the updates for this, because I'm really hoping in the future that's going they're, they're going to continue to refine that and get all those little kinks and bugs and stuff worked out. So I'm going to put a link below so you can check out this device and maybe you're going to check out and see if other people are having issues with, with the operating system that you're using. I'm thinking Mac OS is going to be maybe your best bet for this for now. But, you know, the Windows ex user experience might be better than the Linux one. The Linux one might be the worst, you know, experience. So don't base your decision whether you want to use a device like this based on just the Linux aspect of it. But so even though I had some issues with the software, I really like the concept of this product and the use case that it's designed for. And I really hope to see more improvements because I, I can see they're continually working on revisions because there are certain things that, have, that were improved even while I was doing this review. When I first started looking at this device, the audio wasn't even working. So they got that, that functionality working through the HDMI in an interface. So that's pretty cool. So I just want to like to see that continual refinement because at some point this will be even nicer because once it was working and the mouse and keyboard was responding, it worked. It did work really great. So until the next video, I'm Dustin Casto. See you guys later.